Hello everyone. Today I'm with Taria Ward and Taria has a PhD in depth psychology from the Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, her dissertation was on reawakening Indigenous sensibilities in the Western psyche. And that's what we're going to talk about today, Taria, in a moment. After 30 years of living in the Los Angeles area where she married uh, where she raised her family and uh, worked for 20 years as a, minister, as a minister and later as a professor of undergraduates and graduates. She moved to the ancient mountains of North Carolina in 2004, where she founded the Bridging World Retreat, where she leads or led regular retreats and vision quests. So welcome, Tara. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. I'm, I'm just fine. I live in Asheville, North Carolina now, and mostly work with dreams and people's dreams in private work and in teaching. So that's that's more what I do now. Yeah. Uh, and have been since I moved here in 2013. So that's the update on the, my uh, short biography that I probably haven't updated recently. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully, we can talk a little bit, you know, maybe later on about um, about what you did at the retreat centre, though, and uh, you know some of what you did there. But we're we're talking about reawakening uh, the indigenous in the Western psyche. So, can can I just ask you what led you to that? How did you arrive at that? What were the turning points or the influences that led you there? Right, John, that's a very good question. And it's good to kind of go back to the origin story of my interest in all of that. And, you know, I, I'm sure I can pinpoint it to an evening. This would have been probably in... Uh, in the early 90s yeah. uh, and I was a minister at the time and I was writing I was writing I was doing a lot of research on the nature of ritual and how ritual has been used over the millennia and why it's important and what the effectiveness is and all the uh, reasons for you know how it's used over in so many different cultures and religions and uh, the effects on the psyche. I was very interested in that. So I was doing a research project there. I happened to be at a little bookstore <clears throat> in Pasadena, California. And I saw as I was checking out a book that was sitting right by the cash register and it was called Ritual. And it was by a man named Maladoma Some. Mm -hmm. And the little sign next to it said that he would be speaking in the bookstore that evening. And I thought, well, I'm writing on this subject and here's the author and he's speaking on this subject. And I you know, would love to hear what he has to say about, you know, being an African uh, of African origin. Um, he was from uh, West Africa. Um, so I came to the bookstore that night. And, you know, John, this is one of those points in time that are, are just so beyond time and so unforgettable trippy but yeah, i think trippy is the slang yeah. exactly <laughs> it was so trippy and it was all a perfect setup because it the the lecture was in the basement of this old building and so it was really musty it felt like you were going deep in the earth to get down there yeah. and there wasn't any um any sort of normal light there was just sort of some side light on the walls so it was a little bit dark and a very sort of musty and earthy smell. And in walks this guy. And this was Maladoma. Some people probably know him uh, because he became much more popular later. But at this time, he was still kind of a, like he he just published the book. He was didn't hadn't found his two legs yet in the Western sort of thing. Yeah. And so he was just felt so deeply authentic and original and um uh, and I sat and I listened to him and I can't tell you one thing he said, but I felt like I was like my heart was beating at a different rhythm. 
I felt like I could smell the depths of the core of the earth. I felt like I was being like completely uh, exposed, turned inside out uh, in a way that it, it, like you said, Trippy, I can't, it's, it's hard to describe. And he got through speaking and he was just sitting up on a stool, very sort of confident, but uh, not persona driven at all, just very authentic. Um, and uh, and then he went back up the stairs and I remember coming back up to the stairs into the sort of fluorescent lighting, you know, and, and just feeling like, oh my God, I've been on a different planet. I don't know where I am now. I just felt so disoriented and I, found my way over to the table and and spoke to him and gave him my book and asked for his autograph and just told him how moved I was. And he looked at me, he looked at me hard and deep. And then he wrote in my book and he said, it is good to meet somebody with ancestral energy. <laughs> and I just sort of cherished that, you know, it's like, okay, he saw something. Yeah. I don't even know what that meant at the time, but it was lovely. Were you still a minister at this time? Um... I was still a minister, but the thing is, John, when I was driving home, I had the words, and I don't know where they came from, but I had the words that the indigenous person inside of me had just awakened, and she was not going to go back to sleep. She was like awake now. There was no turning back from whatever she was going to start to want to talk to me about. And it really wasn't very long before I had resigned from the ministry. It was probably only... A year after that, after 20 years of, you know, of serious involvement, but it began a sort of a deconstruction, you know, and it wasn't sort of linear at all. It was, you know, all kinds of different things began happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, it was some kind of bigger design than anything that I could have imagined was going on there, but that was part of it. So and you've so, been kind of following a nice, what's the word? well-established path can we say and uh, or right. uh, i had studied uh, all the religions right exactly it was kind of a well-established path i was you know i i felt like i knew the parameters of it and i knew where it was going and i was committed for life and um i didn't see any end to it in sight until everything it was like a nuclear something hit and tore it all down and i felt like uh it was something so much more deep and profound of the earth itself that was proclaiming, you know, her authority um, yeah. and calling me back to herself. Um, and it, so it led me on a, on a deep, deep, very painful, very interesting journey. And so yeah. that was what my dissertation was about. <laughs> so. Yeah. So your dissertation was a way of kind of understanding it as well and what was happening and all that. I mean, you know, I, when when I was reading some of your dissertation, I was thinking of um, when Jung wrote the Red Books and, like, you know, he had that big engagement with Christianity, didn't he? And uh, Oh, right. Yes, he did. Yeah. And, and his father was a pastor or something, wasn't he? And, mm -hmm. and but it's like, oh, I don't know what James Hillman said. The Red Book, it's like in the Red Book, Jung opened the voice of the dead or, or the voices of the dead or something like that and uh, spoke to the voices of the dead. And it's kind of like, and in that Red Book, he was writing it down, but it was just such a massive thing that happened to him. Um, right. Yeah. Right, you're right. And it, and it was, you know, my dissertation was about, because... At the time I wrote it, certainly I was in the academic world and studying the Western psychology, you know, through all the, you know, Hillman and um, many of the Jungians. But it was um, it was like how to deconstruct West, the Western psyche itself in order to get to how to awaken for all of us, this indigenous person that has been so... Uh, there's such a shocking view on the indigenous person, isn't it? I mean, to put it in my slang or whatever, it's that the West went a certain way with the rational enlightenment and the modernist right. project and all that kind of stuff. Yes. And then 
whatever has been indigenous has been viewed as um, primitive, savage. But there's been a horrible uh, suppression, repression of the indigenous psyche. Right, and that, you know that that's the tragedy that it was so uh, infantilized, marginalized. You know, called savage, um, uh, not uh, rational, modern. You know um, that, but you know that what I came to discover, and this was through experience. It was not through anything I read. My, yeah. you know words could hardly hold in my psyche for a while there yeah. but it was what i was experiencing was actually the voices of nature itself you know i had trees that began to speak to me i knew when there was a crow overhead before i saw it i you know it was like my senses just came alive in a way that i didn't ask for i didn't even imagine that was possible but it was like at a cellular level something had happened and and I knew that plants and water and air and all of these things had a language and a voice and that they were all talking to each other. And I discovered Thomas Berry during those years. I had discovered him earlier, but his his uh, articulation of things was so helpful and salvational for me. But he said, mm -hmm. we have in the modern world exited the great conversation that is going on at all times. You know, the, the insects and the and the squirrels and the birds and the grass and the mycelial connections and all those things are in conversation they're all communicating with one another all the time and the indigenous person was part of that conversation they understood it they knew when weather was going to change they knew how to get ready for planting they knew all those things because they were part of that conversation and they understood it they had that vast web of intelligence and knowledge that for whatever reason, when modernity came in, decided was unnecessary. Um, and so we we cut off our instincts, we cut off our, we exited the conversation. And as Thomas Berry said, we became autistic as a species. We're only talking to ourselves, only the human matters, only the human voice matters. Um, and with that, we've objectified the earth to the point that we've destroyed the only, our possibility of even surviving on the planet and it's pathological. And it's, you know, it's a psychosis that we're in collectively. We're all part of it. You know, I'm not blaming it on somebody else. You know, I'm trying to overcome it in my own life even after all these years of being concerned with it. You know, it's a, it's a massive project. So how do you waken, Tari? How do you waken the indigenous person? I mean, okay, you, you've been talking about that, and and some of it seems to have just emerged in you. It was lying there dormant, and it mm -hmm. it came back. Um, but how do we how do we awaken that indigenous part of our psyche? Because I I, I agree with you. It just seems like such a it's such a an essential thing to do in this present. I, I really do think it's it's so essential, and it's it it's like we all need to be wondering these questions, you know, just like you're asking, you know, and ask ourselves again every day, mm. as many times a day. Um, you know, I I would say that the the tool that is most important to me, I would say I there's so many. I guess most doesn't even it's not a suitable word but dreams dreams to me it's in the psyche in the consciousness of the dreaming and that's what the indigenous people knew you know they knew about the dreams um and the aboriginal you know talking about the dream time mm -hmm. and i remember you know i i had worked with dreams in the spiritual community i was part of thank god that was such a beautiful part of it was that I was taught at age 24, listen to your dreams, write them down every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about them. You know, we we were guided by them. We, you know, if I was giving a lecture, usually it had four or five of my dreams in there that were part of the story of whatever I was uncovering because the dreams were so informative and helpful as myths and stories that told 
So I, I'd always paid attention to dreams. And then that's why I went for my doctorate in depth psychology after I resigned from the ministry because of my interest in dreams. And that when I began working with indigenous elders and shamans and vision questing and so forth, uh, the dreaming, you know, I recognized that the, for the indigenous people, the dreaming was the, their consciousness. It's like, it's a dimension of the psyche. It's not an activity. It's an, a dimension that we're tuned into and that the dream time is a dimension of our own being that we've shut out just through modernity and those sort of uh, rational um, decisions that we made about how to think. Like Jung said, our current way of thinking is only a very recent adaptation of the human mind. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, like we didn't think like that. we've been <clears throat> thinking for the last five, 700 years or even 5,000 years prior to this, that it's only, you know, a very recent adaptation and uh, that the psyche itself is archaic. And, mm. and so I think the dreaming, it comes from that archaic aspect of our being that was here before all of it, you know, that was followed us here from the stars or wherever we came from, um, you know, that that psyche is, is still alive, still <coughs> intelligent, ready to breathe its, you know, its wisdom and intelligence back into us if we'll just open ourselves to it and the dreams are a really big way to do it. And just to, to not only the dreams of the night, but to get into the dreaming of the daytime. And that's where you sort of feel, I, I love the original, the Aboriginal concept of the song lines and the dream tracks, because sometimes you hear that thing and it <clears throat> reminds you of a dream you had 15 years ago. And then something that happened five years ago. And it's a, it's like the dream <clears throat> track and lights up and you see the constellation of the information and messages. And if you follow those dream tracks, those have been with us all along and they lead us forward. So to me, that's where the energy is. That's where the excitement is. So I think for awakening the indigenous aspect of our own nature and being, respecting the value of the dreams, you know, and certainly in depth psychology, that uh, is something that I was all, that was why I wanted to study it because it was so foundational to the, you know, the depth psychological approach to the psyche and life is the dreaming. It's kind of like, you know, remember when Jung spoke about two types of thinking and there's that directed thinking and, and it's, it's almost like we've been so much in the directed thinking of, you know, the action list, what are you going to do next? And this, this, this. And to tap into that other side, which is open to the signals, to the world that's speaking, to the um, messages that, that come um, to the soul, you know, it, it, it's a different kind of space to get in, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. And it is. Yeah, it's a good point. It's the directed thinking that he said is just such a recent adaptation. And he said directed thinking is is something that we do for a purpose. It's not the whole of intelligence. It's it's like it's like how to wash the dishes kind of thing in the thinking, you know, how to get some things done. Mm -hmm. And he said directed thinking is exhausting. You know, we're tired when we've spent the day in our directed thinking, we're exhausted. Whereas that's this other form of thinking, which is more indigenous to us, um, more native in terms of is, uh, gives us energy. And I think we all discover that, like when you get into your writing or whatever, it's probably you're getting into that other mind that is actually providing energy rather than exhausting. It's got a, rich, it's got a richness. And, and it's some richness that one wants to, what is it, pre preserve and maintain and protect and allow to grow or, or something along those lines, you know? Yeah, yes, definitely. And it's, it's what connects us to everything. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, for some reason, what's occurring to me right now is a story I just heard just a few days ago, somebody was telling me about this man in Africa who um, 
was a student of you know that uh, <coughs> of nature itself in Africa and he was out there alone a lot I think sort of vision questing that kind of sort of way of being in nature and he figured out or learned that all of the um elements you know like the bugs the insects the birds the squirrels the you know crawly things all of them had these tones that they kind of sang together and when when the tone went a certain way he started to notice himself when the tone went to a certain level it was it was all of them notifying each other there was a hawk present and so when the hawk was coming, which, you know, they, the predator and they were the prey, they all got underneath things. He, he observed it, you know, that the, it was, he could hear the sound of all of them talking to each other and all of them like protecting each other and themselves to go low when the hawk was present. And then there was a different tone he noticed when there was a leopard coming and then they'd go high. The birds would go high, the squirrels would go high, the insects would go high because the leopard was at that level. So they'd go down for the hawk, up for up for the uh, leopard. And he said, then one day he was walking through and he started to hear the leopard sound and he knew he was being warned there was a leopard coming. And so he went and, and rustled apart a, you know, a, a branch of something with a big knob on the end. So he had his stick, you know, if he needed to defend himself. And, you know, I loved hearing that story, you know, that he was part of it, but it reminded me also of when I was on a vision quest, I was 10 days, this was out here in North Carolina, after I'd moved from California to North Carolina, I just wanted to know the, the mountains deeply. And so I decided to go 10 days alone in the mountains yeah. and just kind of listen. And I found a, a little spot, it was wonderful. And I have so many stories. I could tell so many stories, even just that 10 days. And I'd done it 10 days in California too. There are just stories that come out of these things. Um, but so you, day, you, were, you were by yourself? By myself for, uh -huh, for 10 days. Uh -huh. um, and I did, had done that previously in California. When I did it in California, I shaved my head. I went in, I was, you know, uh, I, I was working with a shaman at the time who was kind of watching over me spiritually while I did this. Mm. Um, I had a different sort of approach to it when I came here and did it myself. But so I was in my little place. Uh, I made my circle and had my camp and was staying there for 10 days. And there was a uh, up on the ridge up here, there was a hiking trail where occasionally a hiker would come through and maybe had a dog or something. And as soon as I'd hear the hiker and the dog, I'd get really, I'd go low. You know, I didn't want to attract human conversation because I was, you know, in a different intentionality of being there. Yeah. And so I, I got really quiet and I noticed all the animals got really quiet when the human and the dog went by. And then as soon as the human and the dog had gone away we all woke up and started doing whatever we were doing and at some point I realized they're not thinking of me as the human anymore you know like they're really used it's to me because, they're all scurrying around yeah. scattering around our thing and then when somebody was coming through we all got quiet and I realized I was part of that you with were part them. Of it was yeah. very precious to realize yeah. that yeah, yeah. That's very it funny. was very sweet yeah and here's an here's another story I will tell from that ten days. Then uh, mm -hmm. we'll go wherever you're thinking. But the, I love this one. There, I was wishing that there was a place that I could go watch the sunset because it was a little wooded where I was, and and I was in a place where if I could have gotten to a place to watch the sunset, it would have been beautiful. But the only place I knew to go, would, I would likely find hikers, and I so I wasn't doing that. And I had this wish, I was sort of sitting under a tree and had this wish and was thinking about it. And this crow came over and just brushed, brushed my, like my shoulder and flew right past me straight into these bushes that were across the way ahead of me. And I knew like I was at the end of a string, I knew to just follow it. I just went after, after where the crow went and went through these thick bushes. Yeah. And when I got through them all, you I found see. a spot where I could watch the sunset every night. 
all by myself. Nobody else knew about it. It was all through the bushes. And I knew the crow was hearing my thought. Isn't that just so moving? Yeah, it is. It's, I was that's dreaming. like that's like uh, what's the word? Attuned, you know? Attuned to, to nature. Um, yeah. Yeah. And to know that we're that known, you know, that whatever it was about nature that was hearing my thought and my longing and knew how to help me answer that. And that you know, gets back like, to, you know, right at the beginning, Tari, when you're talking about perhaps how in the modern world, you know, the rational world that, what's the word? What we've, we've viewed the Indigenous as a little bit stupid without understanding that kind of intelligence, that uh, incredible intelligence uh, that in comes. Right, exactly. I mean, they knew how the world works, how the stars work, all of it. You know, the, the whole starry cosmos was no mystery to them. Uh, nor any of it. You know, they knew how to be in absolute uh, collaboration and harmony with everything. Uh, you know, then when we became, I don't know, modern and developed directed thinking, technological thinking is what Heidegger called it. Mechanical thinking is what some people call it. Yeah, it's true. The modern industrial mind is what Brian Swim calls it, which I think is good. It's, you know, domesticated mind is what Levi Strauss called it. everybody had a name for it you know it's like this is what we've developed and it's like we've become these computers that do this kind of technological thinking or in modern industrial thinking and have forgotten that we have these other aspects of mind but the indigenous people had that and that's where the genius is that's where the brilliance is they would never pour poison in the river or uh you know in the soil the way that we I mean yeah, it'd it's just be it's ridiculous. That, you got, that none of that was going to be suitable for the life systems at all. I mean, so how we got so stupid as to um, think that there was any reason to develop these poisons and then pollute everything and kill our uh, own potential for survival, it's, uh, it's I so pathological. And I, I like, I don't know who said this, I think it might have been James Hillman, but it was along the lines of, you know, when we talk about the uh, climate problems and and all of that, but when he was talking about the Anamundi, he said, you know, something along the lines of, if you love the world, you won't damage the world, really. It comes down to a kind of a... Uh, yes, uh, yeah. A love thing of being part of it, of being in that experience or... And attuned to it, all of those things. Right, that's so beautiful. And Thomas Berry had a very similar thing that that's what guided him was, he said, when I was a boy, I was in love with the field. I was in love with that field and the flowers and all of the creatures that lived there. He was so in love with it. And so it guided him through his whole life. Whatever I do, it has to be good for that field. If it's mm -hmm. bad for that field, it's it's not good. It was like that was his guiding thing. Whatever is good for the flowers and the and the uh, living aspect of that was good for life. Was good for him. Was good for everything. And and he let that be. So that's like what Hillman was saying. If you're in love with it, you won't hurt it. If we detach ourselves from that emotional attachment or or um, connection or experience of it, then, you know, we're like the sociopath that just doesn't feel. The one thing I really appreciate about you is you were, um, you know, minister, scholar and all of that, but you haven't just, you've kind of lived it. Uh, what is it? The, the soul of the world or whatever. Again, in you know, Hillman's language, I suppose, but it's kind of like, you could have stayed as a scholar. I mean, what were you thinking at all this time? Like, that's a big change, right? You were a minister. You started yes. having all these experiences. You went on those vision quests. But um, it, it was, was a um, huge change. You know, after, I got, after I finished my PhD, I had a job in a graduate school and in an undergraduate school. So I had two jobs teaching. Yeah. And at some point, I realized 
that I was teaching a lot of these things to students who were driving in, driving down the 405 freeway, had their cell phones in their pockets, came in, we talked about things, you know, whatever to whatever extent it was Mild, Mildly stimulating. <laughs> right, then they pull their cell phones out and left and get back in the freeway. And I realize it's incoherent what I'm trying to do. It's incoherent for me and my own connection to what I'm passionate about here. And it's incoherent for my teaching in this place. And so I made the decision and there were a series of things that happened to move to a mountaintop here in North Carolina where I was out in the middle of nowhere. I was far from anything. Um, and that was part of my healing process. I wanted and needed that, but it was also to be coherent with what I was caring about. And I would bring people, that's why I started a retreat center. It was like, bring people there. By the time they got all the way to me to, on these gravel roads up on a mountaintop, mm. they were already, you know, like in a different frame of mind. They'd left it all behind to come here with their little suitcase. And, you know, then we would do dream work and vision questing work and, you know, that sort of thing. But the mountain itself became their teacher. I was just sort of hosting you know, their experience there uh, to whatever extent, but I, nature was their teacher there because it was so powerful. Um, and uh, and that's what I needed. That was coherent with what I was doing and living alone on that mountaintop for nine years. I didn't know anybody who lived alone in that way for nine years, you know? And I thought about it later. Thoreau was on Walden Pond for not quite three years. You know, and he's, you know, he developed a lot of understanding and wisdom and writing out of those three years. But I was nine years on that mountain mm -hmm. by myself. And I need to sort of recognize that. I, I thought it's after it was about eight years, I thought, well, it took me seven years to get my doctorate, three years of coursework and four years to write the dissertation. And I said, I've been here for about eight years at this point. I think this is my second doctorate. But it's it's in a different yeah it's a different i mean thing to call it the real field work kind of understates it a little <laughs> but yeah. uh, it, yeah. it is you know but it's the jump that is sometimes not made isn't it to 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 live it yeah yeah it uh it was it was divine you know when i uh i had a screened in porch out on the mountain and, you know, this almost makes me want to cry just telling about, it. but I, I slept there every night, except for the very really wintry months. So probably nine months of the year, I was slept outside and I was under my blanket. So I was plenty cozy and warm um, on my little, you know, it was like a cot, like a thing, but it was very comfortable and cozy and warm, but it, it was screen. So I, I smelled everything that was in the wind. I felt the wind as the wind was coming through. I heard the owls. I heard the coyotes. I heard the all of the sounds of the forest that was all around me. <clears throat> I could see the clouds going through across the sky and the moon start over here and then travel across the sky as I'd kind of wake up and roll around through the night. I could see all the star constellations, you know, sort of moving along. I was a part of it every night as I slept and dreamt part of it. It was it was ecstatic for me sleeping out there every night for years and years. It was, you know, when I moved into town and had- And, to and you didn't get eaten or bear. anything like that? I had, I had a bear that would come up and sniff around. I always knew not to have any food there. The bear would sniff, but you know, <laughs> just was curious you know, would go on right on by. I was never, I never was afraid ever. I'm afraid among humans. I'm not afraid out there. Yeah. That was what was phenomenal. You know, it was, uh, it was only humans that could scare me when I'm out like that. It's, uh, mm. those seem dangerous sometimes. I just don't know what's going to happen there. But, you and know. Why, I think, why was it time to, to come back to the city after those nine years what happened what, what happened there well uh i had a, a physical incident where i had to get, go to an emergency room and it was it could have been critical and i 
I was very fortunate, you know, a neighbor was able to take me down to the hospital and get me there and I was taken care of. It was all fine. I was in the hospital for about six days, but it scared my daughters, you know, and I have daughters and they are so dear. And one of them said, mom, you know, you can't live out there forever. You can't, you know, at some point you're going to need to come back into town. You need to be able to not only be near medical care, but you probably need to be able to go to restaurants with your friends and see a movie now and then and all the things I didn't do for all those years out there. Mm -hmm. um, and she was concerned for, I was mowing six and a half acres myself on a tractor. You know, I was taking care of all that property and I was taking care of the retreat center. Yeah. And I was, I was big job. I think, naive enough to think I could do that forever. Yeah. And my daughter's smart enough to realize there was probably a time limit to how long I could actually yeah. manage all that I was doing there. And have you been so, able to carry that experience into now? You know, in the yeah. sense of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I live in Asheville. It's uh, It's got its own story here. The, the forest across me is from me has just been taken down for townhomes they're going to build. It's just a tragedy, but there was a forest here. Um, but, and I'm doing dream analysis work, you know, with private clients, as well as teaching a lot about, you know, all of this. So it keeps me really, um, involved in the things that I really love and care about in that kind of way. And, um, and I, yeah, it's, it's a big part of me, you know, it, it, I carry it with me. Um, and so it's, it's a little more uh, of a focus on the dreaming now. Yeah. That's kind of what followed me here. And after my retreats, it was people would call me because I had worked with dreams at the retreat. So they would call me to talk about their dreams. So that sort of practice developed organically. It was just people all of a sudden were calling me to talk about dreams. And now I do a monthly community dream, a global community dream symposium. Every month for seven years, my colleague and I uh, held a dream symposium where we listened to just as indigenous people always listen to the, the dreams of the village, we call this the global village and whoever becomes, we listen to the dreaming and it's very uh, supportive and very, you know, it's always got some kind of powerful messages for us. And uh, yeah. so I stay you know, really up with the dreaming in that kind of way that uh, that's on my website under Dream Symposium page. If anybody's interested to come, it's free and available every month. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I carry it with me in a in a new kind of uh, format, I guess. In the last several years, I moved here ten years ago, so I lived yeah. out there for nine years, and I've been here ten years in Nashville. Tori, maybe you can help me with something. And this is fuzzy thinking on my part. It's just okay. you know, <clears throat> sometimes I think. It's a dangerous topic too, but I, I saw a podcast a few days ago. How okay. wo how woke is destroying Hollywood? And sometimes I think about uh, what is it like? Some of our compatriots, uh, the <laughs> the way in which people are dealing with the present situation, is to come up with. Uh, what is it, rules or a set of guidelines with regarding speech and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and what's correct and what's not correct. And I've been finding lately, I've been thinking, you know, and, and remembering everything that you were just saying, you know, is mm -hmm. that I've never woken up in the morning and thought I'd love to go woke you know, and pull people up for saying the wrong thing and this and that and that, you know. It, it's, I know what the intent is to make things better for people and all of that. But there's something about actually going wild. I'd rather go wild than go woke, you know. But I think that uh, the going wild needs to be fleshed out of it. So, so the long and short of this very roundabout question that I've been asking you is what is what does it mean to go wild? You know? Oh, to go wild. Oh, I love that. Um uh, and and sorry, I'm just adding one last thing because you told me about a dream you had as well. And 
part of that dream, I just had it written here somewhere, was that um, you had to make your song go wild. Oh, right. Yeah, that dream. I love that dream. Um, right. So, yeah, that, okay, let me, let me get the words back from the dream. You have to release, that was the dream, you have to release the wildness in your song. And yeah, that dream I only had a few months ago, but uh, it was in the dream. It was almost like a dream within a dream. It's like, oh, I'm having this dream again. I'm having the dream about my song. And and I, it was very familiar. It's like, okay, I, I have this dream a lot, which I don't remember in waking life, but in the dream, I know I dream this dream a lot about my song, about singing my song, about and um and then in this one there was something new to it you have to release the wildness in your song and That's you know when I, I love. yeah i love it too <laughs> and it was kind of a new thing like okay well what does this mean to me um and i and i i think the you know the song is something that's in the sort of in the aboriginal world that every person has their song you know, in the in African communities, the every person they they have they sing their song to them their whole life, and you know if a child goes astray, they sing their song. When a child is born, they're singing their song. When they're dying, they're singing their song. Um, so there, you know, there are the and the in the Celtic and the Irish world, there's something about each person having their own song. So it's very druidic. It's you know, there's a whole history to that. So I sort of thought, okay, that's what the dream was about. But this was about the wildness in the song. And I'm still kind of trying to live into the question of what that was. But it was interesting. And I started in the dreams that came after that, trying to release the wildness in my dream. I was trying to, I was working with that. And I, I remember one of the dreams where I was, I sat down at a round table and I was working on this wildness and the CIA and the FBI came in and sat at the table with me and they were gonna <laughs> shut down that. <laughs> that was uh, So I thought those are the aspects of my own psyche, you know, the CIA and the FBI, they're trying to keep law and order here, you know, in here and we're not gonna let you go wild girl. You know, it's like, uh, so, you know, I realized I was working with not only elements of the world that those would represent, you know, that kind of try to keep things in order, you know, chained. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the way that we internalize those things that were, were helping me, uh, they were shutting it down, basically. So I'm still working with that, John. I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about it. What are your, what are your thoughts about that? Um, oh, I... I... I think that you know this it is such a it, it's such a time that there can be a little bit of a retreat to ideology or fundamentalism sometimes um uh -huh. I, I think we were speaking a little bit about fundamentalism before we started but mm -hmm. it's kind of i don't pretend to have got to the bottom of this in any stretch you know but I think that maybe there's a desire for, for some level of stability or certainty within the chaos and within the change and the, and, and what does Rick Tarnas call, you know, the, the death rebirth that's happening around us and the upheaval and, and, and all of those things that are happening and that perhaps trying to set rules and talk about language and speech and you know is, is is a desire to get some control and some uh some certainty about it but i think somewhere in all of that is is that if there's not the direct and you know i think maybe you might have talked about this the the religious experience or the natural experience as well maybe we could say that ideology comes in and fills the vacuum um and it becomes a, maybe a defense against life and uh, uh, spirit and nature and God and all these big things which are very hard to contain. So somehow, you know, even when I was reading your dissertation, becoming 
wild, I would say, is become becoming open to these big things, you know, uh, in our life because religion can save us from God and psychology can save us from the psych, psyche and uh, so it's an opening. But but I think when people think about wild, they I'm going on a lot here. I've just realised I've been talking. I love been talking it. I'm, I'm right with you. <laughs> I'm totally with you. I'm loving it. Please do. Keep going. When people talk about wild, they think in the same way they've thought about the indigenous savage. Like if uh -huh. a man, you know, if we if, if we if we talk about wild men like Robert Bly, you know, sometimes you think of wild rapists or something like that, you know. It, it's, yeah, right. We, we think of savage, of primitive, but wild is actually this openness to a big world, you know, uh, to a big cosmos, to a natural cosmos, um, and, and, and being brave enough to have that openness. Yes, and, the, you know, I that reminds me, you know, as you're saying all these things and what what does it really mean? It's such these are such good reflections. And I like what you say. It's all of these things are like a defense against life. Um, which, you know, take, I, I did a um, shamanic journey once and somebody had asked me to come sort of help her sort of bless her new land that she'd bought. And so we were doing some things there and we did a journey and I was surprised in my shamanic journey I went back I didn't this was not coming from me it was amazing it just something took over and I went back to the earth before there was even organic life on the earth you know this when the earth was really really new and before all of us were here even you know the you know the plants and so forth everything it was before all of that mm. and there was spirit here it was so rich and full mm. and i could feel it it was like before all this life developed organic life there was life in this other way there was spirit it was wild and rich and gorgeous and beautiful and organized you know it wasn't uh disordered chaos it was yeah. you know there was a uh a, an elegance and a uh yeah you know an order to it in its own beautiful way and that's what and science it, talks uh, just for one second you know when they talk about the order in the chaos or the hidden order or the you know it's yeah. the, the order behind things you know yeah right exactly that yeah those are beautiful concepts that they've been able to articulate um and i just you know i think that's part of who we are too you know we're we're not just these living in the way that we understand living beings in terms of our organic life you know or even our connection to the organic life we're part of that life or whatever you call it that was here before and that's that might be the wildness that's in us. That is the really primordial, archaic psyche and self and soul that was part of, you know, the whole cosmic order that's very in touch with all that and alive within it and um, aware of it, conscious of it, um, and how to bring that into our the life we've set up with our, you know, even just organic life itself and then all that we've done in the last you know, era of modernity and so forth, how to bring all of that intelligence back in. How do we be in touch with all that is in a way that matters, that, you know, that informs us, that isn't uh, um, uh, unnecessary, but necessary. You know, it, it, it feels necessary to me. And I feel like that's kind of what I feel like your question is, Where, what is that wildness? And I don't think it's a destructive wildness, like the, you know, the rampage and the rape and the, all that kind of wild behavior. Uh, I think that's just disordered um, human uh, ailment. Out so, of sync. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. 
that's good. So, you know, how do we how do we just tune into all that? It's right there. I feel like it's at the core of every cell in our body, in our being. Mm. It's right here. It's ready to talk. Mm. Um, and how do we listen beyond words? And You know, in Aboriginal uh, language here, there's a word called dadiri, which uh, I don't know whether you've come across that, but it means deep listening. And, oh, uh, I like it. How do you spell that? Uh, D A D I double R I, the deer. Oh, I love it. And uh, it's a, it's a. I've heard it spoken many times by by Aboriginal people. Like it's a big thing of being able to to listen deeply. Yeah, I mean, we need to learn how to do that in all the ways. You know, start with ourselves. How do we listen deeply? And with each other is, you know, are there fellow humans, but then also how to listen deeply, you know, in all these ways to these other aspects of life and, um, you know, the, what we're a, a part of, you know, the great conversation as mm. Thomas Berry. To listen deeply it. to the great conversation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, Terry, I, I know we it, it's it's interesting though. I did have a couple of things that I wanted to okay. just just maybe just a couple of you know a few quick questions. Sorry to treat it like this. I know that's you know, but no, I love it. Anima mundi. What does that mean to you? Is that everything we've spoken about? Would you call that the anima mundi? I suppose so. You know, I know that term from Hillman. Right? Is he is he the one who? coined the word oh you know, well it's been around for a long long time and, and it has it yeah, yeah. and in, yeah. The, in the renaissance or whatever in soul of the um, world soul of the, the world of the world yeah i um i became aware of it through you know a lot of people who were very interested in hillman's work and i know he used didn't he write a book with that yeah. title yeah yeah uh -huh. right um and so I'm I'm quite aware of it. It's not a term that I have used or worked with myself that much. The soul of the world, I feel like um, that's what attracted me to depth psychology. It was is because it's so it's soulful. You know, I'd come out of religion and I wasn't gonna go into clinical psychology. I wanted the soul of the psyche, you know, that that I feel like that's what the depth psychologists, you know, were interested in. Yeah. Um, soul right. um and so uh you know it's not words that i'm familiar with how exactly other people use that it but the concept of the soul of the world and this uh is what has attracted me to this uh, the field that i entered you know like where i got my doctorate and uh um right. you know I think from no, from knowing just a little bit about your, you know, from that time in the ministry too, and, you know, when I think about some of my own story, it was there was a kind of a bit of a leaning towards the spirit, let's say, and then somehow maybe over time moving towards what I'd call the soul and then uh -huh. the soul of the world, you know, the world that is alive or whatever, it's... it's I had to come down from that tower of the spirit a bit and, and kind of enter into the soul uh, would be the way I'd describe it. Yeah, I like that. And it and it and it distinguishes soul from spirit. It's almost more part of the subtle body is the soul, uh, um, where spirit is maybe uh, a lot of mind in the spirit sometimes, a lot of intellect, a lot of purity. Whereas yeah. the, the soul kind of has the earth and attachments and, you know. Yeah, it's more organic. It's connected to feeling and those kind of ways of experiencing. Um, yeah, the the discernment between spirit and soul and then matter. It's like that, that place between matter and psyche is uh, where a soul resides somehow or... And um, an animal, you know, in the animal mundi, it's like animal is a key word there too, baby. You know, the the, the feminine. Uh, yeah, as well. yeah, you're right. Yeah. And reenchantment. 
I've just got two more quick questions. What is reenchantment? Have you found what how have you found it with yourself? How do you re how does one reenchant one's world? Well, you know, I would say how does one do that? I, I I think that's a lovely question and we should all be asking ourselves. But for me, you know, when I began just going out into nature and allowing myself to experience, you know, like I would do these longer vision quests, like the 10 day vision quest, that was my idea. I wanted to do it on a shaman who was like supportive of my doing it, but I wanted to do it. I wanted to be there long enough so that I became aware of what you know the intelligences were that and, and like i said there's so many stories i could tell of that because it's so intelligent and so perceptible and that was enchanting i was totally enchanted it's amazing i've never felt less alone you know people say you were alone all the time no I, i've never felt really less alone you know i can feel alone among people but you know in that way yeah um so I that you know, and i you know i think um th there's such a thing as going into nature even very intentionally for into a sit spot you know that's a term that i think john young was the one that coined it but um where you find a place in nature where you go and you sit for like 15 20 minutes a day and allow yourself it doesn't take 10 days to do it if you can do it in 15 minutes if that's what you've got if you do it with all kinds of intention and just be there and let yourself listen smell feel you know what's the you know what's going on around you what is this you know wind that's moving through what is the scent of that what is this little bug doing over here what you know what how am i part of this how are they aware of me how can i be more aware of them you know, what is our collaboration here? Um, that is, it can be so enchanting. You know, if we allow ourselves, it's so not boring. It's so, um, you know, it can be so much more interesting than whatever we're doing, you know, uh, in our sort of ordinary sphere of, of duties and influence, you know, things that we need to do. So I would say to re-enchant the world is to recognize how enchanted it is and to allow ourselves to participate and open our awareness of the enchantment that's, you know, that's all around us. And that's like, that just is opening the song lines and the dreaming tracks. Yeah. It's all becomes part of that. It just starts to lead us forward. It just lights up, you know, uh, everything that's great so, that's yeah. great sorry i think that's a beautiful place to end and it's uh um such uh, uh such a essential thing and um such a wonderful thing you know my little grandson he'll be outside um digging in the dirt and you know i have a little water stream out there and and he you know throws rocks in it and He's out there. He can be out there for hours. He's just singing and digging and, you know, for just enchanted. He's just enchanted with it all. He's got all kinds of elements of things that he's working with. And occasionally there's a truck and a thing and a little, you know, whatever, but mostly it's the, you know, whatever he can pick up and throw that's out there. And he can do it for hours and hours. And I think, and then we take him and we make him sit in a desk and hold a pencil. Mm. And that's when they learn, learn, you know, that they become disenchanted sometimes. You know, there's, I, I, I certainly am a proponent of education, reading, writing, you know, learning about the world that we inhabit and all the things. But I think we have to be more careful than we are about Buckminster Fuller, one of his things that he said often, was uh, that every child is born a genius and becomes degeniused in the process of education. And that's a tragedy. And I see, I think we all know of wh whereof he speaks there, you know, and, it, it, and it's like the genius of my grandson that can be out there for hours. It's, all, it's, it's already uh, employed in the world. It's already happening. He's already living it. You know, it, right. it's not something to kick out of someone. You know, it's something uh, uh, it's, lovely. 
Yeah, it is. He's so energized by it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think enchantment is normal and natural to us and it's been trained out of us and we need to recover it and reclaim it and re-experience it and allow ourselves whatever time it takes to let ourselves become re-enchanted um, and honor that time. Well, that's a lovely place to finish. And I want to thank you very much for uh, sharing. And um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, John, for the invitation. And what a complete and utter delight it is for me to have this conversation with you. I've just enjoyed it immensely. It's been Stunning. very enchanting. Yeah. See you later. Bye. Yeah, thank you.